Hi, I'm Mohamed Zaboy, and I'm an entrepreneur from Soweto. Soweto's come a long way, from a small township to a mini city of its own. Soweto's got some really, really nice suburbs, like Deep Cliff Extension, but the locals call it Deep Cliff Expensive. Orlando's known as a suburb that had the first brick houses built in Soweto. Orlando Stadium for its iconic games between Kaiser Cheese and Pirates. And most importantly, Villagazi Street, where Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu resided. Hi, I'm Mohamed Zaboy, and I'm an entrepreneur from Soweto. Soweto's come a long way, from a small township to a mini city of its own. Soweto's got some really, really nice suburbs, like Deep Cliff Extension, but the locals call it Deep Cliff Expensive. Orlando is known as a suburb that had the first brick houses built in Soweto. Orlando Stadium for its iconic games between Kaiser Cheese and Pirates. And most importantly, Villagazi Street, where Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu resided. To the west of Soweto, you find suburbs of Dobsonville and Pretoria. and welcome to episode 39 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamandunga Kumalo. Now, a number of us are probably at home, and one of the big things that we're probably thinking about is perhaps extending that family house. You know, you're probably looking at relatives at home, and you're thinking it's long overdue, probably, you know, even started that Pinterest board to just spark up a little bit of inspiration. And you're wondering, how do I even get started? How do I budget for this? What are some of the things that I should be looking out for if I want to do that project? Well, if that's one of the things that you want to do after this lockdown, even during this lockdown, then this is the episode for you to help us better understand you know some of the dynamics that go beyond or that go with renovating a home some of the things that you need to be looking out for and making sure that you don't work with the wrong contractors i know a lot of us probably have some of those horror stories this evening i'm joined by ululu mutukira who is the CEO of Namaste, who's going to help us out with this one. I mean, a lot of us always have this on our vision boards at the beginning of the year. You want to surprise Umama or Ugoko by extending that family home or even your own home. So to just help us uh, with this particular one, Lulu, good evening. Thank, Thank you so much you, for Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. So I think one of the things is before we even get excited with, you know, what should we go shopping for, uh, our budget and those kind of things, for viewers who are probably sitting at home and thinking that's definitely something that I've been wanting to do, uh, and maybe it's even something they've been, you know, slowly saving towards. What are what are some of the things that you should be thinking about and start prioritizing even before you start shopping for, um, you know, that extension at home or getting contractors to give you quotes? Okay, I think the first. Um really important uh, uh, step before even, you know, like you said, shopping and looking for contractors is to really uh, uh, sit down with yourself and understand what the intention behind the extension is. Because we find that a lot of people just have, a, a, you know, open space at home or they've just got an open lot and they like, oh, you know what, it would be very nice to get myself a bedroom, an extra bedroom or an extra lounge. That shouldn't be motivation enough to, you know, extend because there's a lot that goes into the extension process. And um, you should really, you should really understand or know why you are going into this, into this, into this route or going this route. 
The second bit I think that then uh, starts becoming very important is to understand what the rules of engagement are within your property space. So are you a homeowner in a, you know, in a, in a, in a lot, in a, in a plot, or are you a, a homeowner in a, in a, in an area that has a homeowners associ associations such as a complex or a townhouse, etc. Different rules apply for those different spaces and you have to work within those rules. So if you're wanting to extend within the, the, the realm of a townhouse, um, within the realm of you know uh, an area that is mandated by a homeowners association, you have to get those building permissions. There's no way around it. Planning permissions are an important aspect of the extension uh, of the extension game. You have to you have to understand what the rules are within your your property with regards to extending, and then you have to sort of get those permissions in place before you even start the process of getting your contractors in, before you even start getting to the, the process of getting planners in. Yeah, and when you you are mentioning that there is actually quite a lot that goes into the extension process. So beyond identifying, if for example, uh, let's say Ugoko or um, Mama or your family home mm. is in, either in the township or in the rural area. So you certainly know that you don't have to deal Fair with owners association or, or the corporate that kind of stuff. And 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 now you know that okay, here's the house, and maybe it's currently a four a four room house or a five room house. What are some of those processes that actually then go into thinking through okay, um, that particular extension? Okay, so now we're at the place where we know that we don't have any, there's no permissions that we have to get. Oh, we went to the municipality, we got all our permissions in place. We know that we can do this thing. Now we're at the place where we need to get contractors. Yay, please guys. <laughs> Get the right contractors. The horror stories. <laughs> Lulu, the horror stories. Oh. I, I have my own, uh, admittedly. And, and and I think, you know, sometimes you go in, you're very enthusiastic, and some of them will even show you some of their past work. Um, if you're fortunate, maybe you'll get one that, uh, you know, a friend recommended. And it's possible that a friend probably just used them for tiling, you know? And your project is bigger than just the tiling gig. And it might need them to be able to you know do electrical work and plumbing work and you're thinking look this guy is 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 reasonable enough is affordable enough so why not you know what's the worst that could actually happen i know that it's very hard it, it what i'm about to say is, is is almost counterintuitive but budget should not be the driving force against you choosing the contractor for your home it shouldn't you should be able to vet this person so getting the right people means being able to vet the people that you're, you're getting to, to do your your space but before you even vet them, they need to be able to come to your space and be able to tell you how the space needs to be planned out. Because there's also different uh, elements. So, like I said, there's no homeowners association that's mandating you to do anything in a certain way. But if you want to build a double story, for instance, what are, what is what is what does that mean for your neighbor? What does that mean for the people in and around your your space? Um, if you're wanting, for instance, to build a space that is vertical, so something on the ground. What does that mean for the for the for the the sewers in the in the area? Is is your home within a piping system that that affects everybody in your space? So only a professional, a real professional, can answer those questions for you. This is why we come with problems where we, we especially Makaya, like you've said, where Uma has built or your, the daughter has built a beautiful room for Uma, but suddenly it's falling apart because there's water damage everywhere nobody came and told that person that you can't build on top of this land because there's water underneath underneath here that's going to affect your structure um so critical to get the right people so it's not just about getting iplamba and getting uh the you know the the guy who's going to be able to do the cement the guy who's rhino lighting the guy who's selling the bricks it's about getting either an architect or a draftsman if you don't have you know the budget nor do you have a need for an architect to come into the space, get a draftsman, just some somebody who's got the professional eye to be able to see what the lay of the land is and what the capacity and the capability of that land is. Then we go into the contractor, pick them properly as well. And you know, when you when we were talking about some of those checks or some of the municipalities, we're already getting questions around that particular one. And one of the questions that's coming in, of course, to viewers at home, please do send those questions and comments if you're looking to 
extend whether it's your own home or the family home and you have quite a lot, lot of question marks You're still not particularly sure how to best go about that project you don't know who to reach out to the questions that you should be asking uh, to that particular contractor then do send through those questions and Lulu is more than happy to address them this question is coming in from Otande Gahate who asks I have a standing house so do I need to go to the municipality office before drawing up the plans to extend yes so you um building permissions are something that the municipality deals with you have to go to them especially if you're going to do any infrastructural changes to the space whether you own the house yourself and it's like i said it's on a plot of land that you own you still have to get those municipal um permissions um to extend from from an infrastructural perspective you have to take it to the municipality and i think at that stage you know what are some of the um like what are some of the the ticks that somebody needs to do so you now here's the family home and you're working or you've maybe let's say I've identified I want to work with Ululu and they know that certainly you as a service provider you know how to advise your client in terms of before we even talk about your budget or what needs to be done you need to make sure that you go to the municipality this is what needs to be done maybe you are actually extending and putting a double story so your neighbors also need to be signing to say that yes they are aware that this extension is actually happening so there and you show the plans because i mean we have even seen horror stories where people built you know those rooms in makasi and people complain about the view because you've essentially now blocked them all like completely right so you you're not even passing those um you know requirements when you're building the those homes so is that first check then um before you make that extension particularly the big ones to go to the municipality and get permission right. first so before you even thinking of the future sports and you know going over board because i know a lot of i i know i i probably start with the first first before <laughs> before me i just i need the inspiration and and, and i want to make sure that i at least know what a color palette that i want is and then i'll go to the municipality so is the municipality essentially one of the first places that you want to go to to make sure that um you get the right sign off from them first okay so uh, let me the, there's three there's three layers to what you said the first one is it it's really very much dependent on the scale of the project you're doing and whether there's an if there's an if infrastructural change some um extensions and some renovations are not necessarily something that you're doing on the outside of your home sometimes they inside right you're changing your kitchen you don't have to go to the municipality to change your kitchen but if you're extending the extension to 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 build another uh, a layer or another or another building in your property that is something that you have to get municipal permissions for they also sometimes require what they call an architectural report it's it's very much dependent on the on the on the municipalities and they all run differently but it's very good especially if you're doing a, a very a very large um is sort of infrastructural change to get that architectural report take it to your municipality get all those permissions in place and then you can proceed to the next step now in as far as your statement around getting your neighbor's permission you are not mandated to get your neighbor's permission but it is a courtesy and it is something that we we definitely encourage people to do because there's nothing worse than having ha being a neighbor who had a, a huge amount of light um coming into their house and suddenly there's a whole you know structure that's been built that that's uh, blocking the light for that neighbor they're not going to be happy um and the municipality unfortunately or or whatever body that you you're mandated to engage with is not necessarily at a place where they understand all those sort of nuances and dynamics and so it is it is advised that you do go to your neighbors you tell them that, listen this is what i'm thinking to do this is how it will affect you um i'm just letting you know as a courtesy there's no there's no sort of and then they can they can choose if they're not happy and you're saying i'm going ahead they can go then then themselves go to the municipality and say i'm not happy with what is happening in 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 within within my property area and that's how sort of the the conversations happen with your neighbors but where you are mandated is definitely your your municipality and a question on this you know so they first you know you know our viewers first essentially want to clarify now you know that you need to go to the municipality depending on the type of project that you're doing so some of the projects won't necessitate you having to go there some of them will so in the event then that you are doing the type of project that would necessitate you going to the municipality um a question here coming in from Stephanie Woodboy who says okay so when you go to them meaning the municipality would you have to have a design in place or do you only ask for permission to to basically build 
no so you must have you must have something that you're you're showing them so you have to have an architectural drawing or a draftsman's drawing um something that basically shows what you're planning to do i mean you can go and say i'm planning to build is this something that's that i'm allowed but they're going to tell you to bring whatever it is that you're planning to do and then and then give you those those permissions and listen something that also you must take into cognizance and it does take a little bit of time some municipalities are faster than others some you get those those permissions within a week and you can hit the ground running sometimes it can take two weeks if your project is really a massive one it can literally take up to three months to get those uh, those permissions because they have to make sure that everything all the all the knots and crosses all the all the issues are ironed out before you start and you know what i think one of the things is probably so many of us probably didn't understand just how complex a project can be because like you're saying i mean you could be growing up in your family house and you're thinking one day i'm going to extend this house maybe make it a double story and you think it's just as simple as getting in a few guys who can help you out. They give you a quote of the labor and the material and you start working. But we're slowly beginning to see that it's actually not that simple. Um, there are certain checks that need to be put in place. There are certain professionals that you need to be working with. Um, but of course it does get to the exciting part. So now you've done your checks, you've got the architectural or draftsman's um, you know, uh, report and you've taken it to the municipality. The municipality gives you that green light. They say, listen, we're happy with the plan. You're now able to start building and now the problem might potentially start. We're going to go for a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to look at now what happens. We've got those checks. The municipality says, yes, you can go ahead. What happens next? What do we need to be looking out for next? Because this is probably the more daunting part. I mean, you think regulation is daunting, but more than anything, this is the part that would probably <laughs> gives a lot of us gray hairs. Myself, I have gray hairs. I have gray hairs, so I think it probably gives me even more gray hairs than I have. And and there are so many things you can look out for, the type of professionals that you want to be working with, the types of contractors, the different ways you can optimize a particular project. Maybe if it's too big, you want to like chop it up into you know different sections to also make sure you've got the budget. Because I think we underestimate how expensive building can actually be. We're going to go for a quick break and when we come back, we're going to look at what happens after we've gotten all those checks? Of course, I am on the line with Ululu uh, Musikira, who is the CEO of Namaste. And we're looking at what some of the things that you need to look out for when you're looking to extend your home. Remember, you can always participate in our YouTube competition, where all you need to do is subscribe to our YouTube channel, take a screenshot, share it right here below, and you stand a chance of winning one of two 1,000 rand prizes. When we come back, we'll be looking at more of what you need to be looking out for when you're extending. We'll be back just after this. back to episode 39 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamandonga Kumalo. This evening, we're looking at some of the things that you must look out for if you're looking to extend your house. It might be your own, perhaps your mother's house or the family house, whichever house it is. If you want to you know, embark on that project, we're looking at the things that you want to make sure you tick off, understand before you even walk down that path. So help us better understand this one. I'm joined by Ululu Mutakira, who is the CEO of Namaste. And you know, before the break, we were talking about the regulations and making sure you get all the green lights from a municipality. And, and that's a big chunk of you know, your project, depending on whether or not, of course, your project requires it. So as you were saying earlier, not every renovation or extension will require you to get those 
uh, permissions from the municipality. So if it does, you want to make sure you get them in, especially if you're going to, um, you know, sell your house in the future because they're going to want those building plans. And if they were not signed off, you're going to struggle to sell that particular house, especially if you're going, to, if the site the buyer is going to want it to be financed. So you really don't want to skip that step in your home renovation journey. So now Lulu, really we've ticked all the green lights as far as regulation is concerned. We know that the municipality is aware of this project that we want to do and we're working or we certainly got the right plans in place what happens next like i mean i, I think this is probably the part where people start losing their money essentially because you get in contractors they run away with your money they will tell you you must give them x amount of deposit before they even start working or their workers come to your house and and it can be such a headache i i, I mean i can just imagine the different stories I've certainly heard from friends and family and even my own experience. A lot of us have, well, we shared a lot when it comes to, you know, home renovations or extensions. And we want to make sure, I think more than anything, we want to help viewers at home not go through mm. that process. So mm. what happens next and what should we be doing next in order to have a process that is as smooth as possible? Building is not a DIY <laughs> process. That's step one. Don't DIY a build, please, because a lot of contractors out there are literally DIY contractors. Um, I've, I've uh, seen horrors where people pick up builders literally off of the side of the street. That's the most dangerous thing you can do. I understand, like I said, you've got a budget, you're trying to stick within that budget, but you, you must understand that you're trying to build a structure here. And so you need to get the right people to, to help you in that process of building that structure. There are professional bodies in which builders, real accredible contractors are mandated to be, to be members of. Not all contractors will be members of that professional body, but getting, getting contractors that are members of the MBSA or, or the NHBRC, those are the two professional bodies for contractors um, in South Africa. If you can get people that are are members of those kind of bodies at least you know that they are mandated to operate within the realms of those of those bodies fine not everybody you know not everybody can get the, that level of contractor or that kind of contractor i think the next step the next step then or the next uh, layer then would to that would be to definitely uh, vet the contractors that you're getting get people that somebody has actually used before and somebody's house that you have seen and you are satisfied with the way in which it looks. Um, get refer, get references because references are an incredibly important um, part of the of the vetting process. Get credible, real references, um, and do your due diligence. Don't rush the process of, of of getting contractors in place because you are going to end up paying. You know that the term cheap is expensive. With regards to contractors, it can get very very expensive. And and Lou, when we're doing that due diligence, you know, what are some of the things that we are essentially asking, looking out for, because I can imagine for a lot of years at home, you're thinking, look, I've never done this. I'm I'm an accountant or I'm a lawyer or whatever your profession is. This is not what you do, right? So you're not really accustomed to even knowing what kind of due diligence questions you're asking of the potential contractors that you're about to work with. So what are some of those things that we need to be asking them and following, following up on before we actually choose the right one? Okay like i've said uh asking them and, and getting getting feedback around which professional bodies they're a member of is is the first sort of step to kind of get to a point where you understand that at least they're operating under those mandated rules and regs the second bit is is uh you know asking uh, having an understanding of at what level have they have they built building what a garage still needs somebody who's who's you know, build something at a, at a relatively high, at a high level, building something at a high level, because the garage is still brick and mortar, you still need to build something up. Um, so also we need to get away from this, from this uh, sort of thinking around, ah, you know, you garage, or it's just, it's just a small something. There's no need to get somebody professional because it's just a room. No, a room is as important. One room is as important as a whole floor. The same process goes into that. So maybe also having a conversation around what processes they, they, they put in place, what kind of materials and where do they source the materials. Very important because also you want to be shy, shy by way of price. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning of my professional career, I obviously was very focused on the interior design element of my business and not necessarily the construction. Over the years, I've had to get really down into the nitty gritties of the construction part because then you get an understanding of what, I'm, what am I being charged 
or the material cost do your own homework we are in a place in society now where we've got so many resources to get information um don't take the first quote that you get as well get three quotes it's important get three quotes from th three different uh, suppliers or three different contractors to get an understanding what the the, the cost and uh, the cost variations are the price variations are so that you can start asking the critical questions because once you get a, a three quotes you're able to say my guy you told me that um you know the the rhino lighting cost this much but somebody else has said it's costing this much can you explain why there's a difference in this in this cost but when you go with the first contractor who gives you a quote it becomes very difficult to understand the nuances of pricing and uh, therefore not and then you don't understand the nuances of materials being optimized upon and already as you even you know saying that a part of me is is anxious on behalf of people who are going to embark on this process uh, because you're already i mean if, if for example you're extending a house maybe putting two three rooms you're already thinking there are so many different checks there are so many different like line items that would even go into an invoice when you're buying the material so even getting familiar with some of the words that you would find there and asking those kinds of questions becomes so important because some contractors some contractors will tell you well you know just given the area that you're in and the and and the kind of project that you want to do you want modern finishes it's going to cost you four thousand per square meter another one will tell you it's x thousand per square meter and you're not even understanding okay what what does that even mean right why is this guy charging me two thousand rands more than the next guy and yet i gave all three of them the same um, mandate and the same brief and and the pricing that i'm getting is mm -hmm. so different from each other so i think even that already can be such a daunting process um, and of course, we're still getting some of those questions from viewers at home. And one of them is, where does one find some of these suitable people that, to assist us in this home renovation? So you're almost thinking, is there a marketplace? Maybe your friends haven't you know, extended the, the, the houses at home. Or if they have, maybe they were just not happy with the contractor. So that also doesn't help. Where do people even go to try and source the right kind of people to then get those respective quotes from? Okay, so I know the, like I said, the professional bodies, they've got almost um, lists or um, lists of contractors that are part of their body. So within the NHR, uh, NHBRC, there's, they, they've got their own sort of list of contractors that they, they work with. It's the same with the interior design industry. There's, there's, um, there are people who are part of the body. But in the same breath, there are people that are not part of those bodies that are very credible and very good. I think um, you, when you're making a concerted effort to renovate your space or to extend, extending your space, it's very important to understand that this is something you're committed to. So you must do the homework of, of you know, you can use Google, Facebook. Those are not those are not uh, platforms that are are not not credible. It's just you have to see through them a little bit more carefully to find the right people. But those are we're we're in a, in a space where we've got a lot of resources to try and get those those um those contact details. But I will not lie. Word of mouth is a very is a very important and very and very credible um um a way of finding people even if it's not necessarily your friend or your neighbor but you've got colleagues you've got people within your 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 immediate circle who have must have done something and those are the those are the kind of people that you engage with because also understand that somebody who's who's used the contractor they're not happy with at some point they find on somebody to fix the problems of that 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 botched job and so that person then becomes the the person that they ultimately um will end up recommending so i i really put a lot of i put a lot of um uh, clout or emphasis on word of mouth but you you definitely can do your own homework by way of using social media using the professional bodies i mentioned to sort of get these people so lulu we've now you know so earlier in the conversation we had done our checks now we certainly know where to go and find these Credible contractors. We've sifted through them. We've done our due diligence, and we've settled on on who to work with. And now I want to work with Ululu. What are some of the conversations am I having with Ululu after I've chosen you, for example, to say this is this is what I want to do? Um, what questions should I be asking the contractor? And how do we measure the project in the like whether it's the daily or weekly? I mean, obviously, because it's a home extension. A lot of those types of projects are not going to last three years for for example mm. it's not mm. a mega project so perhaps it will be a few weeks or even maybe a few months but it's it's a relatively short-term project 
how do we mitigate that relationship? How do, what are the conversation, the questions we should be asking? Because I think sometimes you don't, because you don't know what you don't know, you also don't know what should you be asking that person. So even if you want a report back on a daily basis, because you go and check the progress, what are you actually asking for? Asking regarding that progress. That's a very good question. And, and it's an unfortunate but or fortunate sort of conversation. So when you enlist upon, for instance, a designer, interior designer or an interior design team, it becomes easier to have those conversations because you're almost using myself as your as your as your landing port um, to ask the, the critical questions to your contractors. I would have, in any case, for instance, um, uh, recommended people that I know that are credible. So you're already feeling at, an, at a level of comfort. But when you are doing it yourself, so when you are in the process of doing it yourself, I think any contractor with their salts has a, 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 almost a standardized um, a way in which they work by way of timings, by way of uh, report back. Report back is a very important part of the building process. And I think a lot of people don't, don't uh, they do it off the cuff. You know, you walk in, you decide today after work, I'm going to go to the to the building and take a look at what's happening. I see that there's things on the floor. I call the contractor. Can you come in and tell and tell me why this hasn't been done? And that's not how it's supposed to be happening. What is supposed to be happening is that you, you at the beginning of the process, the contractor should tell you how long that they are, they are um, stipulating or estimating this thing is going to take. Once you guys have agreed upon that timeline, obviously there are deviations, especially in the building in the building process. Don't hold that timeline to to as you know. I'm having a party. I've had situations where people say, "The Friday you said you're finishing Lulu. I'm having a party. My family's coming." That <laughs> don't do that. But um, there must be a within- lockdown happens, and then what? Like because I'm sure there are a lot of people who had these plans. Lockdown happens. Your project's going to come to a halt. So exactly. you always need to factor in that. Look, there are other factors that come into play that that may disrupt your particular project. Rain. If it rains for two oh, weeks yeah. straight while you're trying to build, there's no way you've lost that two weeks. So those kind of things are, but but like I said, a contractor will, will have that conversation with you and explain those things to you. And they will consistently communicate when there are deviations to the plan. That's a very important one. You don't want somebody who's quiet from beginning up until end. That's not a that's not a contractual relationship, especially from a building perspective. You need somebody who's going to be able to keep you keep 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 you up to date with what's happening throughout the process, as well as give you weekly or bi-weekly, depending on what your preference is, um, or monthly updates on what is happening and where you are within the project and that means having some tough conversations because building is not a, a pretty and fun exercise in general there's a lot that can go wrong there's a lot that comes up that you weren't you weren't um you weren't expecting but a big part of that of, the, of, of maintaining that relationship and making sure that everybody is happy is communication on a consistent basis if you know zama that um, you know, there was a burst pipe that happened within this, the, the first week of construction. You're not going to be angry that um, construction delayed by a week because the contractor would have already told you, listen, we came to this, this sort of problem. You see it yourself. So I think uh, a contractor who can, who can stipulate and outline what their working process is from the, from the cuff, off the cuff, and then uh, keep you consistently updated in a formal manner, not in a uh, haphazard you know, is all born, I come take a look, but in a really formalized manner so that you can you can keep up to date with what's happening, yeah. And I think, you know, I feel like a lot of us probably have those experiences where the feedback was quite informal. Uh, there was no, it wasn't regular. So it sometimes it would happen because you are the one who actually calls and says, it's been two weeks, I haven't heard from you. Or you end up coming on site to actually check on what the progress is. Or your mom is saying, no, they haven't been here in, you know, in a week, and I just thought maybe you guys have an, a, an arrangement of sort, and yet, as far as you're concerned, workers are supposed to be working for that particular week. So and do you know what that also does and what that helps with is uh, us as, as, as contractors as well, we, we like to work peacefully without the, the client coming every day looking at, at, because if I've given myself a week to finish something, that means on day two, it's not going to be a perfect, it's not going to be a perfect picture. So if, as, as a contractor, I'm communicating with you uh, on a regular basis and I'm, I'm taking you through the process with me, you're not going to feel compelled to come every day to see the mistakes and, uh, and you know, uh, be, be questioning every single 
part of the process because you know that Lulu is going to give me feedback or my builder is going to give me feedback towards the, you know, towards the end of the week, then I'll know where we are. So it also helps contractors once, if they've laid out something concrete, it helps them as well manage you as the client. And I think, Lulu, I mean, one thing is already clear, we're definitely going to bring you back because there are so many tips and tricks that we certainly need to learn, not just from an exterior perspective, but even from an interior perspective, because I think it's one thing for us to extend the homes. You then want to, of course, work on the interior. But before I let you go, we're now, you know, we, we, we've done the project. You're happy with the progress. You're happy with the updates. Now we're slowly getting to, you know, the project closure. What are some of the, I'll say, ticks that need to be ticked before your contractor is done and you make that final payment to them? You know, almost that checklist that you want to go through to make sure that I'm, I'm thoroughly happy. I know that the things that we agreed on have, in fact, been done before you send that last bit of money. Because more often than not, the moment you make that last payment, sometimes some contractors are not mm. going to come back and entertain mm. you because they think, look, I'm done. And, you know, you saw the place, you paid me the money. Why must I spend any more time with you? So before that last transaction, what is that checklist that we should be going through with our contractors? Okay, so the first one would definitely be, is this as per what we agreed upon in the beginning? So as per the the, the drafts, the draftsman's plans or as per the architectural plans, is, does this thing look like what we had agreed to look like? Um, obviously, outside of the deviations that we would have uh, agreed upon during the process, maybe you, you had not wanted a toilet and now suddenly you added a toilet. Those are obviously deviations that came within the process, but uh, on the on the greater sort of on, on, the, on the whole, does this look like what we had agreed upon and then what what you must do as a as a as a client is give yourself a grace period for sna desnagging give yourself a grace period for the snags very important don't pay and if there are any contractors in there forgive me do not pay your contractor <laughs> the day that they give you the keys and say here is your house no you have to have a period and any contractor must give you a period to look for the problems because obviously we've been we've been in we've been part of the, pro, the, 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 the process the builder has been building this 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 uh, this house and they've obviously done their checks so they've done the, the quality control checking so that's a very important aspect as well they need to do before they hand over to you they need to do their quality control checking to make sure that everything that they've said they're doing they've done as well as the health and safety measures um, of that space have been looked into. Okay, then they give you the keys. You also need a period, and different contractors do it from a, for a different time frame. You need a period a week. Sometimes it's two weeks, but more especially uh, with more of the informal contractors, it's about a week where you have time to really look at your your property. Because the the minute you get the keys, it looks really stunning. It looks beautiful. But you're going to walk around and you're going to notice this and that and this and that. And those are the things that you need to be able to notice within the week. And then you go back to your contract and say, can you please fix this, 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 this. And then post the fixing of that. It's called the snagging, the desnagging process. Post the, the, the fixing of all those snags. Then you can pay your contract. The remainder... <laughs> So before I let you go, what are the three tips you would give to viewers at home who are looking to extend, you know, the family home or their own respective homes? You know, three tips to help them navigate that home renovation journey. First one is get the right people by way of uh, uh, structural planners if you're doing a big uh, a big uh, job. So a draftsman if your if your job is not that massive, or an architect if your job is massive. So that's step one. That's tip number one. Get the, 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 they get the right people to do the plans for your space because that will also make your municipal life very easy. So going to municipality with proper plans and, and a proper architectural report will definitely help you out. The second bit is take your time in choosing your contractors. Very, very important. Um, don't rush the, the contracting job and the contracting process. And I think the third tip is put a budget in place. Don't work off the cap. And I know we didn't discuss this in great detail, but a budget is is a really important uh, aspect of the building process. Um, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have, again, some variations, some deviations to the plan. But for the greater part, try and build a very strong, solid budget from the get-go so that you can understand what is happening within your, within your process. And those are three tips. Lulu, thank you so much for joining us. I think we're certainly My going pleasure. to be back and look at how do we even budget for something like this? I mean, the, when when so some people tell us about their, let's say, kitchen renovation and the kitchen costing 
80,000 rands, you're already getting chest pains because you think, well, how is a kitchen that expensive? How do you begin to then, you know, budget for putting in, a, you're extending the kitchen and then a bathroom and, 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 cause there's so many costs that are involved in the home renovation journey. So we certainly bring it back on. And perhaps the next time we bring on, we want to look at how we do it on a budget because a lot of us are probably not going to have hundred thousand rands lying around to, to do those projects. So how do we then go about doing it on a budget efficiently and for it to still look relatively modern uh, and, and something that we'd be happy to put on our Instagram feeds. Lulu, thank you, much, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. And that is Lulu Mutakira, who's the CEO of Namaste. If you want her contact details, perhaps you've got your own home renovation needs, the contact details are right here below on our Facebook page. Of course, we're back again tomorrow with episode 40. We're still cooking up a great prize that we're going to give away for episode 50. I did promise that uh, we'll give something away. I think for where a lot of us are very excited to be making it to episode 50, which is coming very, very shortly. So if you have any ideas of what we can give away, do send those suggestions right here below. We can't give a house yet. Uh, and yet is the operative word. I think one of the big things is the day we can give away a house is probably the day I'll feel quite excited. I'm, I'm excited about the, the prospects of giving away a house, but it's something where we're still working on. So do send those suggestions of what you would want us to give away on episode 50. And tomorrow, it's a Friday, we're going to be speaking to AFSA. Um, and really tomorrow's conversation is actually going to be quite interesting. We're going to be speaking to the young professionals, to the young black professionals um, in property and Tabi saying who is going to tell us a little bit about the work that they do as suburb and really some of the interesting innovations that they have in store for us. So you certainly do not want to miss that one. But until then, I hope you're staying at home and you're staying safe. Hi, I'm Jared Siegel. I'm a local restaurateur and the owner of Jared's Espresso Bar and Eatery in Seapoint. I'm a Cape Town local, Camps Bay born and bred, and I've been living in Sydney, Australia for the last few years. Living abroad, I've always been drawn to the mother city and I've recently decided to come back home. Taking lifestyle factors into consideration, Bantry Bay has been the perfect fit for me. Living on the Atlantic seaboard really resonates with what I'm all about. From the active lifestyle, the amazing food culture, its family-friendly environment and amazing natural beauty, the quality of life we have on offer is really unique. The Atlantic Seaboard has some of the most beautiful suburbs in the country. Hi, I'm Jared Siegel. I'm a local restaurateur and the owner of Jared's Espresso Bar and Eatery in Seapoint. I'm a Cape Town local, Camps Bay born and bred, and I've been living in Sydney, Australia for the last few years. Living abroad, I've always been drawn to the mother city and I've recently decided to come back home. Taking lifestyle factors into consideration, Bantry Bay has been the perfect fit for me. Living on the Atlantic seaboard really resonates with what I'm all about. From the active lifestyle, the amazing food culture, its family friendly environment and amazing natural beauty, the quality of life we have on offer is really unique.